You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, J.T. Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is... Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I am super excited to have my new friend, Joe Stillman, on the show with me. He has an amazing new book. It's called The Man Who Came and Went. And, you know, I know it's only the second month of the year, but this is going to be on my top 10 list, uh, at least of books of this year. Um, The Man Who Came and Went, such a phenomenal story, so fun. Uh, Joe, it's one of those books that when I started reading um, you know, I'm, I, I had it on my iPad and I'm sitting in my favorite uh, recliner in the living room. And when I look up, like three hours had gone by. I just completely fell into the story. And, uh, you know, as a as a storyteller, I know that's one of your goals. You want someone to just get lost in your story. And the man who came and went 100 percent did that for me. I love it. I'm telling everyone about it. When people hear this show, you can go out and grab your copy of it. It will be available and uh, yeah, welcome to the show, Joe. Oh man, thank you, Hank. I, I, I'm, I'm going to try not to be crying when I'm talking with you, <laughs> but I, I really appreciate that. Thank you. Absolutely, I, I, I mean it uh, from the bottom of my heart. Uh, Joe, we begin each show with the same question. We we've got so much to cover today, but we can't get to any of it until we tackle this first question. That question is: What is your first memory? Of wanting to be a writer or storyteller. Oh, I, I, I thought you were going to ask me. You know, Joe, are you married? Um, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, I can't believe I have a, an answer ready. Uh, when I was a kid, the show The Waltons was on TV. You're you're probably too young to remember that. No, I I. I I'm 50, so I, I watched the Waltons uh, weekly, religiously. John Boy was my hero. Yeah, yeah, he was he was uh, my hero too. And I think it was at the beginning and end of every show, John Boy was writing in his journal, and I think he wanted to be a writer. And uh, watching that show, I I just wanted a, a journal just like his, so I went out and bought a stencil pad, um, which was you know a little. Not quite there because a steno pad has a line down the middle, and I somehow just tolerated that. But I think it was watching John Boy that uh, kind of first started me wanting to be a writer. I love that. So, Joe, you know, um, a lot of times we have these these dreams as a kid that there's something that inspires us and we want to um, follow this path. And, you know, for a lot of people um, – you know, kind of finding your way in the world and, uh, you know, having to have a place to live and food to eat and um, life kind of tends to get in the way, um, you know, with uh, with the you know, over a thousand authors that I've talked to on the show, very few of them have uh, a story where that was a singular pursuit and a singular purpose. They just had to follow this. A lot of people kind of had a circuitous route to getting to where they are um did was this a singular pursuit for you or did did other things come along along the way i uh when i uh, decided to think about what what the future would be when i was in high school i i didn't really think about writing and i think that was in part because it just never seemed like an option uh, so I went to school and studied film, and when I was making short films, uh, I really had zero talent as a director, uh, but making films was really all about story you know, and writing. And uh, so I got out of that college thinking that I was going to be a director, and to me, in order to become a director, you had to be a writer. So that's kind of why I, I started. And uh, I kind of fell into uh, 
copywriting for movie trailers, uh, very much by accident. Interesting. Um, just uh, for, for your uh, listeners who are aspiring writers, I will say that there are, are ways to make money, uh, support yourself as a writer uh, that are not necessarily uh, the medium that you might choose. Sure. But when you do that um, in certain mediums like copywriting, uh, you can make a little bit more money and give yourself some buffer. In other words, you make more money for the time that you put in, and so you kind of buy yourself some time to do your other writing. Right, so right. I've, I've met a, quite a number of writers who began uh, in law, and one reason, because there was so much research and writing involved in the day-to-day -day work of attorneys, um, you know, an attorney's life is rarely like in the movies where they they're just courtroom warriors. You know, most of it is is looking up facts and then, you know, finding a, a narrative to craft around that. And, you know, the work, all of the work that goes in before you get to the courtroom warrior and and all of that time spent writing, even though it's not prose, even it's even though it's not the kind of writing you want to be doing is valid. And it 100 percent goes toward earning those those skills i i agree with you i've known a couple of writers uh, one who became a very big screenwriter and the the skill to articulate to research and park yourself in a chair for long periods of time uh all that plus the all the the, the intellectual challenges of being a lawyer I, I think that all i'm sure feeds into it Joe, I've never met anyone who was a copywriter for movie trailers. Um, I, that's fascinating to me because movie trailers are a bit of an art form of their own. I, I know you're kind of cutting up someone else's work and the other work has a, a, a narrative thread, but you're kind of building a new narrative out of pieces of that. What What is that like uh, that – you know, do do you start with a blank slate? Does does the director or the writer say, you know, these are the pertinent points? Like like, how do you take this big piece of work and reduce it to a you know minute to two minutes of of kind of a, a new story? I would say that my first boss um, in in the world, uh, in you know, in the working world of show business, um, you know, after college, he was a trailer cutter. And uh, he worked as a editor in the uh, largest house in New York when it when it was really big. It was a place called Utopia Studios. And trailer cutters, editors, um, film editors, uh, they're artists. And, and he was really an artist himself. And it was fascinating to watch him work. Uh, back then, editing was not done done digitally it was done on 35 millimeter film and his his whole body was involved in the editing process and he would reach for uh, a piece of film from the bin and he would work on the bench and you got the sense that he was fully involved in the work and it was his body and it was some part of him that that created and so i think when trailers are done really really well um, a lot of it has to do with the editor and as, as for the writing of it it is a creative part of it um, and it's a it's a vital part um, he as an editor would 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 have the scripts done first and then edit to the scripts it's a little bit like i would liken it to uh, a lyricist working with a composer you know those two ideas music and, and thought in this case editing and thought kind of come together love that that is amazing um joe you went on from your work in in trailers to um writing some screenplays that that just about everyone in our audience would probably recognize um how do you then get to to work as a screenwriter and um and and you've done some some pretty notable work i'll, I'll let you um rattle off some of those accolades if you want but um you know, and does that start with um, a great idea that then other people get involved with, or did you kind of ha had had you made a name for yourself in the screenwriting world, um, and and then kind of the big projects come along, or is it a chicken and egg sort of thing? 
You know, it's, uh, I guess I'll, I'll just, you know, back up just a little bit, which okay. is to say that uh, after college, I spent about, I don't know, 12, maybe 15 years uh, writing spec screenplays, uh, learning how and uh, doing it pretty badly at first um, and gradually getting better at it, which is kind of how it works, I think, for a lot of writers, whether it's screenplays or novels or, or whatever. So while I was doing that, I was writing copy and trailers and then trailer work in New York City kind of dried up. And so I started working in promos for cable companies in New York. And um, principally, I was working for Nickelodeon. And so working for Nickelodeon um, in promos uh, gradually led to working on a show that was actually created by um, a couple of promo people, uh, Will McGraw and Chris Viscardi. They created a show called The Adventures of Pete and Pete. Uh, I have a long form show and uh, so I, I knew them from from promo work and I, I did an audition and got to uh, work on the show. And so it was kind of a, a gradual, you know, step by step process going from shorter form uh, to to longer form. And um, as a result of working on Pete and Pete, um, well, just to take a, a back step. Uh, um, at the time I was working on that, I also started working on Beavis and Butthead. And um, the reason that came about was that Nickelodeon promos knew everybody in MTV promos. MTV owned uh, Nickelodeon. And so when they started looking for freelance writers, uh, somebody mentioned my name and, and then I started doing freelance scripts there. And doing those two shows kind of put me in in, in, a, in a place where I could kind of get an agent finally after like, I swear, like 15 years. Uh, and that kind of put me in a, an arena where I was able to meet people and, and go up for screenwriting jobs. An Innocent Client, the first book in the Joe Dillard legal thriller series. A preacher is found brutally murdered in a Tennessee motel room. A beautiful, mysterious young girl is accused. In this best-selling debut, criminal defense lawyer Joe Dillard has become jaded over the years as he's tried to balance his career against his conscience. Savvy but cynical, Dillard wants to quit doing criminal defense, but he can't resist the chance to represent someone who might actually be innocent. His drug-addicted sister has just been released from prison, and his mother is succumbing to Alzheimer's. But Dillard's commitment to the case never wavers despite the personal troubles and professional demands that threaten to destroy him. Chosen by BookBub readers as one of the top 100 crime novels of all time, get started on this great series with an innocent client where it all started. Read for free with Kindle Unlimited or buy it in paperback or audiobook. An Innocent Client by Scott Pratt. Things We Never Got Over the new book by best-selling author Lucy Score. Bearded bad boy Barber Knox refers to live his life the way he takes his coffee, alone, unless you count his basset hound Waylon. Knox doesn't tolerate drama even when it comes in the form of a stranded runaway bride. Naomi wasn't just running away from her wedding. She was riding to the rescue of her estranged twin to knock him out Virginia, a rough around the edges town where disputes are settled the old-fashioned way with fist and beer, usually in that order. Too bad for Naomi, her evil twin hasn't changed at all. After helping herself to Naomi's car and cash, Tina leaves her with something unexpected. The niece Naomi didn't know she had. Now she's stuck in town with no car, no job, no plan, and no home, with an 11-year-old going on 30 to take care of. There's a reason Knox doesn't do complications or high-maintenance women, especially not the romantic ones. But since Naomi's life imploded right in front of him, the least he can do is help her out of her jam. And just as soon as she stops getting into new trouble, he can leave her alone and get back to his peaceful, solitary life. At least that's the plan until the trouble turns to real danger. Things We Never Got Over, the new book by best-selling author Lucy Score.
So one of those, uh, you mentioned Beavis and Butthead that you were working on, and the other, uh, a little project that maybe one or two people have heard of, Shrek. Um, how, how did Shrek come about? Uh, I had moved to L.A. after the two shows in New York, uh, Pete and Pete and Beavis and Butthead, and uh, I started working on another show by Mike Judge, uh, King of the Hill. And after I left that show, um, I was introduced to the Shrek people. They were kind of sort of looking for writers to come along uh, to do, um, how can I put this? It's a longer story and I'm trying to think of, of how to <laughs> kind of approach it. Um, a lot of screenwriting jobs uh, hinge on rewriting. Uh, to get a screenplay right is really, really a process. You can, okay. you, can, you can get a job, say, writing a screenplay, or you can write a screenplay on your own and you can sell it if you're really, really lucky as a spec screenplay. Uh, but between that draft that you do yeah. and the draft that gets uh, shot um, and seen um, on the screen, there is a lot of work. And when I say a lot of work, uh, we could, we are normally talking about years. And the process of growing a story is a big one and it's, a, it's an involved one. Um, and it's hard because getting to the end um, of 110 pages, say, is not terribly hard. You can, you can fill it in and, um, okay, let me back up. It is hard. It's really hard. <laughs> but it, it doesn't necessarily lead to something that is, is producible. Uh, getting a story good is, is really, really a process that involves a lot of trial and error. And, um, and, and here I know I'm talking to your audience that um, is aspiring to write. Uh, being bad is really a, a very, very important part of eventually becoming good. And so when I was hired onto Shrek, they had been working on the story for a few years. And yet when I came on, they were still largely in outline form, not in, in script form. And that's normal, especially in animation at the level of DreamWorks or say Disney. Uh, they work at it a long time uh, to make it good. And so that's the condition on, on, on which I, I came onto that project. So one thing that I've always been fascinated with is uh, screenplays are very different animals than prose, um, as as you know, because we're, we're talking about your, your debut novel today. Um, with screenplay, you are um, – the description and, and all of the things that, that make prose – uh, what it is are, are sometimes lacking, and that's up to someone else's interpretation um, a lot of times. And it it seems to me, and please correct me where I'm wrong because I know I'm wrong because I've never done what you've done. Um, but uh, for a screenplay, it's it's very dialogue heavy, and it's it's very much more about um, bringing out the characters. And you know, uh, and of course, you have to do that in prose. But there's there's another element. Um, to prose um, comparing the two since you've you've done both and you've done both very successfully um, what do you see as the things that that differentiate the two art forms mm. <sighs> screenplays are um, are a different animal in, in, a, in a few pretty important ways I'm, I'm trying to be succinct here. It's it's really it's a question I love because it's to me it's a really fascinating area. Um, there is a, a style and tone to a lot of movies, uh, and I would describe that tone as being very very um, abbreviated, uh, to the point, minimal. Um, and in, um, in a sort of gr grammar language that we're, we've come to be used to uh, when we watch a, a movie. And that sounds a little esoteric, so just to kind of boil it down a little bit, 
there's a brevity to movie storytelling uh, that doesn't have to exist um, in the in the novel form. We're we're used to it, so we don't really think about it. But we want our movies sharp and concise and 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 paced, you know, so that you know we get our punctuations and we move on to the next scene. And there's dra dramatic power in 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 that form of storytelling. And there and there's dramatic power in a lot in in um, in prose storytelling, but the style in, in movies has a lot more um, brevity to it. Uh, I'm not sure if that was just too too general, but um, I, I, I want to be concise. I think about how my wife loves detail and, and, and being <laughs> concise, and I want to get there, because I want her to be okay with this podcast. Uh, <laughs> In dialogue in movies, so much is stripped away, and and you have the minimum number of words and syllables, uh, and anything else is fat. And a lot of screenplay writing is getting rid of fat because you want the muscle, you want the essence. And in in prose writing, it's it's the writing itself, and it's the it's the feeling that the writing gives you, and sometimes you get that. In certain writing, for instance, in the writing of Aaron Sorkin, he, his his dialogue has that um, almost a poetry to it. Yeah. Um, but in general, you want brevity in screen work. And I will say just one more thing about it, which is which is the power of having an actor portray a character just cannot be be underestimated. In, in dramatic form, uh, what a what a what a character conveys from an actor can give you pages of of, of prose, and and uh, and so you're telling the story as a screenwriter in conjunction with the actors who don't need a whole lot from you in order to really get a person across. You don't have that in prose. And so your job as the prose writer is to absolutely be that character. Well put. Um, we we talk about prose writers or, or novelists or uh, as having, um, for the most part, a very solitary work existence. It, it's you and the story for a lot of days, you know, in your home office most of the time or at your favorite coffee shop or whatever. Um, and then, you know, toward kind of, at, at least for you, toward the end of the project is when, you know, maybe an editor comes in, an agent, and then, um, you know, maybe you work on the story collaboratively a little more, and then it goes to a publisher and, you know, a little more working. And then, you know, cover artists, people come in and, um, but, you know, all of that collaboration is kind of on that, that tail end 20% or, or so, but the vast majority of that is, is very solitary work. Um, is that the same for screenwriting or does that just by nature tend to be more collaborative? Every project, uh, I found in, in, in my business is different. And so, uh, sometimes, uh, especially if you're writing a spec screenplay, or sometimes even if you're hired to write a, a screenplay, uh, you go away for a, a long period of time. Uh, there are, this um, I imagine will be a little bit boring, so I'll try to say this really briefly. Each screenplay, um, if you're going away and writing a screenplay, there are steps. There's... Um, uh, you know, like a two-page step, there's an outline step, there's a screenplay step. And between each step, you interact with the people who hire you, and they give you notes. And I'm not going to go so far as to call that a social life, but you do get to interact with people. <laughs> and um, sometimes that's the most interaction you get on, in the workplace, and you're really glad for it. And you're really glad, or I should say I'm really glad for the participation and the collaboration, because you can't really do this alone for too long. You work in a vacuum. You don't really see what you're doing. 
you're in the, you're in the forest. You're pretty much seeing the trees or the branches, and so it's really good to have somebody outside the forest to come in and, and give you um, opinions, and and that's where feedback is great. Uh, TV and, and film are, are two very different animals, and and TV is just a, a really social endeavor. You know, when you're on a staff, and I'm 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 speaking to you uh, from a conference table right now because I'm I'm working in a space that I was able to get because I have construction going on at home, <laughs> and when you work in TV, you spend you know eight to twelve or sometimes sixteen hours a day in a room like this with other writers sitting in chairs, um, developing back problems and gaining weight. Uh, because <laughs> that's the that's the process. That's the collaborative process in TV. Screenwriting is is tends to be much more of a of a solitary process. Great, Joe. One of my favorite things to ask people is um, to describe the moment of creation for you. Um, so, and what I mean by that is, with the uh, at, at one moment in time. Nothing about the man who came and went existed in any form or fashion. It just it didn't exist. And then either a character walks onto the stage of your mind or maybe you're reading uh, an article and it triggers, uh, you know, a moment of creative imagination or um, you overhear a conversation somewhere. And then these characters just infiltrate your brain and, you know, a story is there. Now it's you know your job as the writer to kind of dig that story out and excavate it and polish it up and and all of that. But but there's a moment of creation that happens. What what is that moment like for you? I'm going to uh, answer that um, in a way that might might be a deflection. I'm not sure, but it's really the example that comes to mind. Okay. One of there my are favorite- no wrong answers here. <laughs> uh, if only it was that way all the time <laughs> if only uh, i i have a favorite movie that nobody's seen so this is a real chance to kind of just mention it because um it's a wonderful movie and, and just doesn't get the attention it deserves it's called topsy turvy uh the director if I, I hope i'm getting his name right is mike lee and it's a it's just a stunningly great period piece um, about Gilbert and Sullivan. And um, Gilbert and Sullivan, uh, when the movie starts, are kind of in a repetitive syndrome. A lot of their their new 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 musicals resemble the old ones. and and there's a sense that they're not just regurgitating, but they're just not doing very good work. And um, is it Gilbert or Sullivan? I, I forget the name, but one of them goes, very, very reluctantly to um, a Japanese, um, how can I put this, like um, there's a meeting hall where there's a, a show going on and, and, and people from Japan have come in to kind of show what they do. And he is seeing things that he hasn't seen before and he's seeing um, people from Japan um, acting out kabuki and he, see, he, he buys a samurai sword and somewhere in the middle of all this, he has a moment where this new stimulation comes to him and he gets an idea for a new musical. And um, Jim Broadbent is, is the actor who plays him. And the look on his face and the joy as this idea comes to him, I, I think is the greatest example I've, I've seen in, in, in movies. Um, of of somebody getting an idea and and what that feels like based on Jim Broadbent's um, if I, I hope I'm pronouncing his name right based on his expression was that so, a real deflection yeah that was that was perfect that was that was your answer so there's you know how how am I to say that that's not the correct answer for you um, in the man who came and went when when I first started um, looking at the book. Um, Joe, I, I saw some people comparing you with Neil Gaiman, and I wondered what they meant by that comparison. And when I started reading the book, um, it uh, it uh, the book does not remind me of Neil Gaiman uh, 
in in certain ways, but I think I understood what they meant. Is that kind of all all bets are off. Anything can happen in this book, and you know, um, I, I I love that. Um, there's a there's a mysterious air um, about the world that you've created, and l- you can literally feel the electricity in the air that's just charged with with the fact that anything can happen. Um, wh- what was how did this book get started for you? What what was your what what were you thinking about that that led down the the what if trail that that brought this book about? Well. I would tell you uh, honestly that uh, I had been working on this story uh, as a as an independent screenplay, which is to say, writing it um, as a uh, intended to be an independent movie. That's what I mean by an independent screenplay. Okay. Uh, and I started it uh, around '91, and. Pretty early on, I got a, most of the really big pieces, um, the characters, um, Blutha and Maybell and Martin and Rose, and, um, and I knew pretty much what was going to happen. I knew most of the story, and it was the character of Bill and that side of it um, and the spirit of the story, because that to me is the spirit of it. Uh, that I was having trouble with, and I would write it, and then I would stop and go work on a job and uh, be away from it for a few months and then come back, um, assuming that I had a great screenplay waiting for me, um, Mm -hmm. but realizing that it, it really wasn't doing what I wanted it to do. There was something that was not feeling right. And that happened over an inordinately large number of drafts, probably 40. Um, But the spirit of it really, really mattered to me. It felt like, um, oh, sorry, that was my game. Um, It felt like that was the reason for the story to be. And it kind of felt like that was the reason for me to be a writer. Uh, I loved getting jobs. It was such an honor and... uh, and, and, and it felt like a validation that I, I really sorely needed. And I worked with some really great people. But I felt like everything hinged on this for me. And I was having the, the hardest time feeling like it was successful uh, as a screenplay. And over the course of, uh, yikes, two and a half decades, uh, <laughs> uh, where... At the end of each draft, I would say, oh, good, I finally done it. It was worth all the time that led up to it. Yay, that time was justified. Uh, only to come back and look at it afterwards and think, oh, no, it's, it's not there. And during that time, uh, the independent film market, which is really what this was intended for, kind of cratered, you know, there, it, it just changed, you know. Yeah. When I started, there was a really vibrant, exciting um, um, market of, of people coming up with with great stories, and you know the film market had changed, not just the independent market, but the overall film market. And so I thought, well, even if this does get made, it'll go on Netflix, it'll disappear, and not too many people will see it. And so I just thought I wanted to exist off my computer somewhere. And, and, and so I decided j- just to write it as a novel just so that it, w- it would exist. Uh, so I don't know if that answers your question. To be honest, well, I don't remember your original question. <laughs> well, as, as you started rewriting it as a novel, um, you know, just knowing that the form was changing, that the that the work would be interpreted, um, did that like – did that add layers of complexity? You know, now instead of having the director, you know, decide what the what the visual might, you know, all of that. Now you're required as the writer to fill in all the things that that all of the different people in the collaborative process would have given to the project. Now you are all of those people. Um, you know, d- did that uh, th- that fact um, kind of center into your in, into your process? And uh, you know, how did you start? approaching that. Mm. 
Uh, that was very much a part of the process. Um, and I and I will just say that there was something also that came before that, which I didn't know to expect. And, and this made all the difference for me. Um, we were talking earlier about the difference between writing for screen and, and writing for prose. And as soon as I started writing this for prose, um, I was completely free from all the constraints that are required for screenwriting. And that has to do somewhat with the brevity that I had described earlier. Um, but there's something else too. I think there are certain things in screenplays and in movies that are just not quite allowed. Um, you know, you if you want to talk about something, you kind of sometimes have to talk around it. You can't hit things on the nose too much. Um, I think there's there are just those constraints don't exist in, in uh, at least for me in this project um, in the in book form in the prose form, and so no longer having to kind of squeeze this into that fun but narrow um, framework for movies. I felt like I was kind of finally just like like open to go wherever the story wanted to go. And as soon as, I mean, literally the first day I started writing this as a novel, I felt like now I could finally do the story. And, and in truth, I was able to do that because it was a novel. I love that. I love that. So you mentioned earlier, Joe, this cast of characters um, that, that you uh, have filled this world with. And, uh, We've got Belutha and Maybell and Bill. Um, when did you when did you know um, that this was going to be, um, you know, a, a cast of characters and not just a a, a even though we're uh, we follow the story through uh, Belutha, she's our narrator. Um, but there's it's definitely this uh, this cast of characters that we're um, that we're joining on this. You know, some some uh, books or, or stories have very narrow focus and it's all about this one person's experience. But this is is uh, is definitely a, a, a cast production, if you will. What what was what were your thoughts about the, the way that you staged this world and, and who we got to experience the story through? Hmm. I'm, I'm going to give you the best answer, which okay. is going to be a terrible answer, which is, <laughs> I don't know. Um, sometimes, uh, I, you know, I want to kind of be a little pretentious, and I was going to say, sometimes the story tells itself. Well, yeah, that's, well, this is the one place where that is an absolutely valid question. This this is the one place where you can say the characters told you something, and 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 nobody's going to look at you askew. We, we all know what that means, but sometimes the story is just cast with characters when we show up as the writer. Hmm. I, I would say this was a, a gradual discovery thing at the beginning. Like seriously, like in the early 90s, I, you know, I'd been living in New York City and, and got a house or was renting a room in a house in upstate New York near, near Rhinebeck and walked into a coffee shop because I was drinking coffee at that point in my life and saw a waitress there and that was Rose and that kind of started that ball rolling for me and and it, it kind of worked that way with a lot of the characters and then once finally when the process started happening um when it came time to think about scenes the the it was the characters uh, where the scenes were who kind of like form the or the origination or the origin for the scenes. And that doesn't always happen uh, when you write. Um, and it's not always called for uh, in screenwriting. But I think that all writing, when it's, you know, I, ideally um, kind of comes from the characters as opposed to, say, from plot or even worse from theme yeah. um, because then it feels like it's more human. Yeah, I get that. Um, 
Joe, um, I'm I'm going to read something from the book, and I'm not giving anything away because it's literally the first page of the book. Um, but in, you open with, before I can start the story, I have to tell you something that happened near the end of it. I'm sorry if that seems weird, but believe me, you're going to be really glad I did this. Um, tell me about that choice to begin a story that way. Uh, in the first draft of the novel... Uh, that wasn't there. Uh, I sent it out cold to agents. I did what all writers do. Uh, and uh, there was one agent who read the draft. Uh, her name is Emma Sweeney. And she uh, said that she wanted to work with me, which was great news. And she was a terrific agent. She uh, had this... Um, amazing list of clients and books that she created. And what she said to me is, you have a storyteller uh, who can't possibly know certain things because uh, she wasn't in every scene that takes place, and yet she's telling us what happens in all the scenes. And I thought that was a really good point. And Emma offered three or four um, choices for possible fixes, which itself was a wonderful thing to get from an agent, right? You, sure. you hope you, you spend your life hoping you, you find people who can help you make a story better and, and give you good notes. And one of her ideas was to start the story um, with Valutha um, relating what, what happened um, at the end. So that came from Emma Sweeney. I love that. I love that. So we we meet this great cast of characters, but when Bill walks onto the scene, that's when things just really go off the rails. And we we have uh, all read stories before, or seen movies where we use the trope of the the mysterious drifter, and um, you know this mysterious drifter has a a strange ability. Um, but with Bill, um, he he goes to work at the diner and he can read people's orders before they give them, which I thought was just hilarious um, and, and really set up some great things to happen in the story. Where, where did Bill come from? Hmm. I, I guess I would say I don't know. It just uh, early on, it just seemed like how to tell the story I wanted to tell. And it seemed like. Um, that would be a pretty cool sort of understated weirdness. Yeah. And, and so that, you know, something like that. Understated weirdness is, uh, is something that, that I think a lot of us can, can connect with. Um, one thing that is prominent in, in this book, uh, is, is the, the undercurrent of humor that's always there. Um, it's not a comedy per se, but there's a, a wry humor that's woven in and out of, of just about every scene in the book. And there's um, almost a snarkiness, but not in an off-putting way. Um, what does the role of humor, um, what does having that tool in your, your toolbox as a writer, what, what does that allow you to do? Or does it open doors that, that without humor wouldn't be open? Yeah. Um, when I uh, started writing promos at Nickelodeon, um, one of the things that we were all doing, there was this department of amazingly smart and creative people there, uh, in the, you know, back in the early, late 80s, I guess it was. And writing funny stuff was your, was your ticket in. And um, I think that's always been the case. Uh, to try to to have that, it just makes things more enjoyable, and there's a value to it. You know, you know, for any writers, you know, aspiring writers listening to this, um, if you can write funny, that actually is a is an asset that you know you can get hired for. And so, I know I'm kind of all over the map when I'm talking about this, but to me, it's it's such a valuable layer to have, especially if you want to. Uh, go to a place that's also emotional. The combination, I think, is something that I like a lot when I see it, and and definitely, you know, try to reach for. Well, that that's what I was going to say. Uh, is that even uh, emotionally charged scenes that that uh, that are dark and emotionally 
um, gut wrenching, even uh, a a well placed um, moment of humor uh, brings levity that that makes the other emotions hit harder. Um, it's mm. you know we 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 talk about people that are thriller writers or um, uh, mystery writers that you know you can't just keep people's adrenaline pegged to eleven for the entire book. You know you need to let them off the hook every now and then. Allow them to laugh, allow them to emotionally connect with a character so that when you come back with those um, with those heavier elements, they hit harder because you've you've allowed them to experience the whole uh, emotional gamut. Does, does that factor into to your thinking about story? I think for I for me, if you know, as I think about new stories, um, I feel like I must have um, a layer of funny in there, um, and I'm I'm not sure exactly why, except that it really belongs. And um, and the, what you said is, is is absolutely right on, which is um, the 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 combination uh, of something that that hits you emotionally and something that kind of undercuts it is um is something that i personally you know think is a great thing to aspire for aspire to well, yeah the man who came and went is available everywhere now when you're hearing this uh you can we're gonna have links to it in the show notes where you can grab it uh in kindle edition or hardcover or go visit your local bookstore and uh support local books uh joe like i said in the beginning this is one of my favorite books that i've that i've read this year um and it's it's one of those stories that just sticks with you and i feel like i'm carrying these characters with me uh throughout my life and uh, you know that's one of the hallmarks of a great storyteller um if people are just learning about you and want to dig into all the great stuff that you do is there a place where they can connect with you online uh, yeah, I have a website, joestillman.com, and uh, that would be the place to do it. Excellent. We'll link that up as well to make it easy for folks to find you. The man who came and went, go grab it today. Uh, I promise you'll uh, you, you'll thank me for it later. Joe, this has been so much fun chatting. Thank you for taking time to come on the show. Thank you, Hank. It was really, really great talking with you. Now stay tuned for an audiobook excerpt from Richard Glebe's The Jason Crane Series. No use crying over spilled milk. Eliza hated that cliché. She'd grown up a cliché. Her life a bowl of cherries, duck soup, easy as pie, child's play behind a white picket fence. Mother had been the Wyatt Earp of clichés, firing them off quick draw. A rotten apple spoils the barrel. Smile and the world smiles with you. Every dog has his day. Children should be seen and not heard. She believed them all, particularly this last. Eliza obliged, preferring to wander the streets of Wytheville, Virginia, on her own lonesome terms. The divorce left Laura a spinster librarian, and one false step on icy stairs left her an invalid as well. The accident happened on New Year's Eve, 1950. Laura had just locked the doors of Wytheville Public Library, we must make black-eyed peas tomorrow, Laura had been thinking, with turnip greens. That ensured a lucky new year, and if you swept some money over your threshold, a prosperous one, too. She loved those old southern traditions. She looked both ways, checking for negroes, but turned to heel on the icy marble of the stairs and fell into the bushes below, breaking the long bones in both legs. Eliza had taken advantage of her mother's absence. She'd lost her virginity that same night. She'd swept Ron Partridge over her threshold, initiating her own beloved tradition. She was nursing a hangover, giddily reliving the event. But around 8.30, she realized that her mother had not come down to breakfast. She checked her mother's bedroom, found it empty, took the bus down to the library, climbed the high stairs, knocked hard on the library doors, and heard a groan below. Laura lay under the William Penn Barbary bushes, below the yellow-trimmed windows of the non-fiction section. Her white stockings ran Jezebel red with blood. Sweat and melted snow had soaked her blouse, and her gray forehead blazed. The broken bones didn't kill Laura Merrick. She lay in the hospital, wheezing, her legs mortared up in casts. 
she had few visitors after the first week. Her church group was glad to fret over a poor thing for a day or two, but they trickled away when Laura had the bad manners to linger. On Valentine's Day, as her mother slept, Eliza drew big, sloppy hearts on her casts. Laura harumphed when she woke and insisted on keeping her legs hidden beneath blankets afterwards. But in late March, something miraculous happened. Laura's self-control dropped. She ranted at nurses, spit at doctors, swore like a Navy pilot dropping F-bombs on Hiroshima. She had dementia, the doctors said. Eliza decided that her mother had just stopped believing her own bullshit. The spells continued over the next two weeks, and Eliza enjoyed her mother's company for the first time. They swapped bawdy jokes, ogled the handsome interns, and chattered like best girlfriends late into the evening. They had long conversations, and Laura spoke her own mind in her own words about things that mattered to her. It broke Eliza's heart when the prim, condescending librarian returned. Laura hardly acknowledged anything that had passed between them. The clichés returned. You can't have your cake and eat it, too. A leopard doesn't change its spots. Nothing is certain except death and taxes. This last proved true. On April 15th, Laura Merrick marked her Bible with a tongue depressor, set it on her nightstand, leaned back against the headboard, and coughed blood down the front of her nightdress. Eliza found her that way, dead as the proverbial doornail, and yes, the blood was thicker than water, just as her mother had always said. Much thicker than water, in fact, perhaps as thick as molasses in January. <laughs>